and this happened to me a few years ago. I told the story of my divorce to a friend, and he advised me to share everything. It started a few years ago when I thought we were happy. We were a professional suburban couple, financially stable, living a good adult life with two children, a 14-year-old girl and a 9-year-old boy at the time. I thought we had a healthy social life. We were going through one of the common crises of a married couple. Both of us were working long hours, not spending enough time together. We were facing some developmental issues with my son, and tensions at home were a bit high. I noticed that she was spending more time on her phone, messaging her friends. I didn't think much of it. I started making more effort to leave work when I could, help at home, and be more emotionally available. But over the course of a few weeks, the divide between us kept widening. I accidentally stumbled upon some messages when I loaded an old iPad for my son to use. Her Facebook Messenger was still logged in, and there were many highly questionable messages with a guy from her hometown whom I'll call M. The messages weren't completely inappropriate, but I could sense that some were missing based on the timing and context of the messages. The next day, after I took the day off to work on some projects that I thought would make her happy and left some sweet notes reminding her how much I appreciated her, she was again in the corner of the room, messaging her friends. I took my son's iPad to the office and opened Messenger in real time while my wife was humiliating me. She and Jean were making fun of all my flaws, insecurities, and secrets that I had confided in my partner. Now they were a source of laughter for her. Not only that, but even though there wasn't an explicit conversation, there were implications throughout the conversation, especially when she criticized my performance in bed. I managed to take a few screenshots, but I lost a big portion of the messages because while the conversation was happening, she was deleting them. I wasn't emotionally stable. I stayed in the office until she fell asleep and drank a bit. The next day, I took some time to reflect, drank, and tried to figure out what to do. When my wife came home, she wanted to know what was wrong, and I just said I had a bad day. A few minutes later, I was watching the iPad as the disaster continued to unfold. Then started a few intense weeks of taking screenshots, drinking, and distancing myself from the relationship. I knew there was no going back from there. The messages were now openly explicit, with my wife fully involved in throwing around I love you messages. I consulted a lawyer and assessed my options, starting to move forward. Here is where everything became absolutely surreal. While watching the messages, I discovered that the other guy was coming to town to spend a quality weekend with my ex-wife at a very nice hotel. I missed a lot of details. They must have had a phone conversation about it at some point, but I could infer enough to know when and where. The next day, my wife was pleasing me and wanting to go on a spa weekend with her friends to relax. When she returned, we could really focus on our marriage. I agreed with everything, it was the best idea she had. I would do anything to get our relationship back on track. I sought a lawyer and asked them to draft a strong separation agreement in which she would move out, have weekend visitation, and there would be no alimony until the divorce was finalized. Then I went through the most agonizing two weeks of my life. After all of it, most of my feelings for her had completely disappeared, and I was just boiling with anger like never before. The day arrived. I took the day off work. I withdrew half the money from all our joint accounts, leaving the other half for her. I had already redirected my salary to a new bank. I closed our investment account and obtained a cashier's check for her half, depositing my half into my new account. I stopped at Office Max and printed around 75 pages of screenshots of Facebook Messenger conversations, killing time because I didn't want to be home. She sent me a message saying she was leaving and that she loved me. I told her to have fun. I arrived at the hotel around 8.30 p.m. and called my wife's phone from the reception. It went straight to voicemail. They were probably already having a good time. It didn't matter. I went to the reception and asked to be connected to the room phone. It rang three times, and he answered. Hello, can you send my wife down to the reception, please? I don't know what you're talking about, man. Whatever. All right then, I guess I'll have to call Mrs. X to have her come down here. 
Hold on, give me a moment. I knew he was married and knew her first name, but that was it. Nervously fidgeting, you have five minutes. Less than two minutes later, my wife stepped out of the elevator looking a bit disturbed. I made her sit in a corner of the reception. She started babbling, saying it's not what it looks like, etc. I'm not here to discuss the things written in this stack of papers. I want to know what's going on. The only way I won't give a copy of this to our daughter, send it to your parents, and show it to everyone we know is if you move out immediately. My wife was very proud. Our daughter was going through a rebellious phase in adolescence, and knowing about the situation would probably have ended their relationship forever. My wife was also her parents' golden child and always cared about what they thought of her. I didn't have much leverage, and shame was my only card to play. Furthermore, her professional life was built around her image, so I knew she would protect it at all costs. She mumbled something inaudible. This is a check for half the money in the money market account. I withdrew half the money from the other joint accounts. You should have enough money to find a place. She starts crying a bit. I could almost see the different thoughts and waves of emotions passing through her, but now it was time to keep pressing. Here's a separation agreement that I believe is more than fair, considering what's happening. I need you to look at it, sign it, and leave it at home when you pick up your things. Do you want to look at these screenshots? No. Okay, go have fun with him. Don't come back home, or I'll send this stack of screenshots to everyone. I walked away from the reception, and I could hear her starting to have a breakdown. I reached my car and drove to a parking lot where I had my own crying and anger crisis. Before, I would have cried in front of her, shouted, and everything else, but I managed to control myself enough to hold it back. I don't know what she did that night or over the weekend. She sent messages and called several times, wanting to talk. I simply hung up the phone. When Monday afternoon arrived, there was a moving truck picking up her things, and she handed me the agreement. I let her talk to the kids, basically saying that mom and dad need some time apart but still love them, etc. Standard divorce talk. After a week, she wants to have a real conversation for the first time. I listen because I already have my life in order and have an idea of what I want, but I think she regrets it deeply. She wants another chance. She wants our family back. She'll do anything. She's on her knees, crying in my lap. I have no intention of taking her back. I tell her she needs to schedule individual therapy on her own time that works for me. I tell her I can't live with her, but she should be around the kids and try to maintain a relationship with them. And so begins our new normalcy of her coming home to cook and have dinner with the kids three nights a week. She always saved me a plate. I would distance myself, and she would clean the house and do the kids' laundry, then go back to her place. We went to therapy. It consisted of her working on her issues with her therapist, trying to figure out why she did it, begging for forgiveness, and me historically playing the victim. I would never give her another chance. All I wanted was to bide my time, establish myself as the primary caregiver for the kids, and establish her as not having residency in the house. After a few months, I went to my own therapist and was diagnosed with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. I asked my work if it was possible to work part-time in the foreseeable future to deal with personal issues, and it was no problem. After six months of therapy, I told her I couldn't forgive her now and wanted an amicable divorce, but she was still the love of my life. Maybe one day we could try again. She was devastated but agreed to the divorce. After we filed for divorce, I made a promise to myself that if I ever tried again, I needed the children to want to stay with me. I left a Google search on surviving your spouse's infidelity on the shared PC at home and discreetly left some printed articles about infidelity in the kitchen. My daughter found them and came to me crying. I told her that she wasn't supposed to find that and that her mom had made a mistake, but that mom still loves her and I'll always be there for her. My daughter, who used to have high self-esteem with my wife, now wouldn't speak to her without yelling, and it devastated me. It's not surprising that when the court needed testimonies from the children a few months later, 
the younger brother followed the older sister's example and both wanted to stay with their dad in the house they grew up in. When the divorce was finalized, I kept the house. I had to buy out her share of the equity, but that's okay. I obtained primary custody of the children and was granted generous child support due to the difference in our incomes, as I was now working part-time. For the past two years, I've been living in the house with my children, working part-time, making ends meet, and when she takes the kids on weekends, I can enjoy some me time with friends with benefits that I've cultivated. In the eyes of my children, I'm the patron saint of fatherhood, for choosing the right path and always being present. In my ex's eyes, I'm the one who got away, and she'll always regret it. And I have the upper hand. But that will never happen. If you're going to commit a crime, you probably shouldn't leave evidence on the property. Housekeepers go through a lot, figuratively and literally, because people can be truly disgusting. Dirty needles, piles of feces, rotten food, clumps of hair, urine-soaked sheets, used feminine hygiene products hidden in the linens, it's not for the faint of heart. You learn to respect many housekeepers. I myself work as a front desk agent, but we are all held to high standards here. It's a good hotel. People often worry about housekeepers stealing their belongings when cleaning their rooms during their stay. Let me tell you, speaking generally about all hotels, it is quite uncommon for a housekeeper to steal. Most hotels take that very seriously, as they should. We have a system in place. When a housekeeper finds an item, they write it in our lost and found logbook, noting the date and room number. They then place it in our storage room with other lost items. If someone calls inquiring about a lost item, we check the logbook to see if we have it. If we do, we return it to the guest, and the front desk agent signs a document confirming the return. If no one claims the item after 90 days, it is disposed of. It's a specific and important process. The other day, at Paradise Hotel, a woman, let's call her Susan, who had just checked out, returned with her husband and informed us that she had mistakenly left her purse behind. These things happen, and you'd be surprised by the items people leave behind. We checked the lost and found logbook, but didn't find anything. However, they had just checked out this morning, so perhaps. My coworker went upstairs to inquire with the housekeeper, let's call her BIA, whether she had been in that room and if she had found anything. As my coworker went up, she saw BIA exiting the room. She asked if BIA had seen the purse. This is my first time in this room today. I just started stripping the sheets now. Ah, well, okay then. My coworker entered the room for a quick check, didn't find the purse, and returned downstairs to retrieve her keycard, intending to go up and personally inspect the room. Susan didn't see her purse and was becoming frustrated because she was certain she had left it there. She threatened to call the police. Our response was, if you want to involve the police, we support your decision, and we will continue to do our best to return your purse to you. Meanwhile, life continued as usual. My coworker was folding keycard sleeves at the front desk, one of the housekeepers was doing laundry, a couple was still cleaning their rooms, and BIA was taking out the trash as she typically does at that time of day. The manager was summoned when Susan confirmed her intention to call the police, so he was on his way. The police arrived and began asking questions. They sent one officer to speak with the head housekeeper and another to talk to the front desk agent from another hotel. The officer asked if she knew anything about the situation. She glanced at him for a moment before returning her gaze to her work and responding. He immediately remarked, I noticed you briefly averted your eyes. Do you have something you'd like to tell me? Well, you're a real Sherlock, she said, explaining the situation once again. The officer then asked, would you be willing to take a lie detector test? Sure, I don't mind. I'm telling you what I know. Calm down, Sherlock. Do you want to conduct a body search on her as well? The manager arrived, and the police requested the surveillance footage from the security cameras. BIA was the only person in the room, but they didn't see her leaving with any purse. So, the police took her to our meeting room to talk to her and ask some questions. She denied everything. They wanted to search her car, so she gave them permission to proceed. 
Meanwhile, the manager reviewed the video footage and noticed BA throwing away the trash. This raised suspicion for both the manager and one of the police officers upon seeing the images. The officer went to check the garbage bin, which was a task in itself because it was enormous. Surprisingly, Susan's purse was found there, without the money. They found the money inside, amounting to $1,280. It was returned to the guest along with her purse, which now had a distinct odor of garbage. Susan didn't want an apology. Seriously, you could have avoided criminal charges by saying I'm sorry. Like, this is why your manager fired you on the spot, without waiting, without warning, without a second thought. You're just fired, as it should be in my opinion. That's why housekeepers are usually so professional. Who wants to ruin their life by stealing someone's wallet? But when someone slips, the hammer falls hard. What a day. Private property means private property. My husband and I have lived in a private community for 56 and 59 years, respectively. There are two entrances to our development. Although there are no gates, both entrances have large signs stating a private property, no trespassing. All the streets in our development are 100% maintained with our association fees, with zero public money. Moreover, all our streets are designated by the city as fire lanes, so parking is not allowed on the streets in our small community. The southern boundary of our community borders the local high school football field, where they hold the graduation ceremony every year in spring. The problem is that there isn't enough parking space at the school for everyone who wants to attend the graduation ceremony. Parking is made available on the other side of the street from the football field, and all people need to do is walk down to the corner, cross at the signal, and then go up to the entrance of the football field. However, despite being informed that our community is private property and not available for parking during the graduation, some people still insist on parking in our community to avoid walking too far. The last time they held the graduation before the virus, I was coming back from work and almost crashed into a car illegally parked on the street. When I turned the corner to get home, I had a bad day, and it really annoyed me. I waited until I heard the ceremony music start and made two phone calls. First, I called the local police and reported that cars were parked in our fire lanes. The police promptly came and were happy to issue fines to all the illegally parked cars. My second call was to the security company employed by our association. They came and arranged for the removal of all the illegally parked cars. There were five or six cars, if I remember correctly. I think many people were unhappy after the ceremony ended when they returned to find their cars had been towed and they had to go to the impound lot to retrieve them. Between the car removal fees and the fines for parking in the fire lanes, it probably ended up costing over $500 per vehicle. All this just to avoid crossing the street. Share your thoughts in the comments. What would you do differently in these situations? The video was made with great care, so give it a like and subscribe. Thank you.